As millions of Americans are preparing to file their income taxes ahead of Monday's deadline, we look today at how corporations and the wealthy are utilizing offshore banks and tax havens to avoid paying taxes and other governmental regulations. Uh, earlier this year, Democratic Senator Carl Levin introduced two bills to crack down on tax havens. Levin estimates that nearly $100 billion is lost each year by not closing tax loopholes. Besides Levin's bill, there has been little discussion in Washington on the issue, despite the intense debate over the budget. During President Obama's uh, budget speech on Wednesday, he uttered the words tax and taxes nearly 40 times. Never once did he mention tax havens. Our first guest today is the British journalist Nicholas Jackson, author of the new book Treasure Islands, Uncovering the Damage of Offshore Banking and Tax Havens. In the book, Jackson writes, quote, the offshore system is the secret underpinning for the political and financial power of Wall Street today. It's the fortified refuge of big finance. Nicholas Jackson joins us from Washington, D.C. Welcome to Democracy Now! Um, talk about what you're calling treasure islands. Nicholas Jackson. Uh, we're gonna, we'll go to a music break and we'll come back to uh, see if we can get the audio of Nicholas Jackson. Uh, looks like we got it right now. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now, Nicholas. Thanks. Thank it's you. It's good very to much. have you with us. Um, okay, explain what these treasure islands are. Well, my book's about tax havens, and one of the big themes of my books is it, one of the big themes of my book is that tax havens are much, much bigger and much more important than almost anybody realizes. Most people think of tax havens as just a, a bunch of shady places, perhaps out in the Caribbean, Switzerland, a couple of other places, uh, where a few celebrity tax dodgers, maybe, and some mafiosi and some some criminals go and put their money, and and they see it as a kind of exotic sideshow to the global economy. One of the central messages of my book, and I explore the history of this in, 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 in quite a lot of detail, is that tax havens have grown so fast in the era of globalization since kind of the 1970s that they have now become right, they are now right at the heart of the global economy and they're absolutely huge. I mean, there are 10, uh, anywhere between 10 and 20 trillion US dollars sitting offshore at the moment. Uh, half of world trade is, is processed in one way or another through tax havens. But it, it's, it's all around us and it's absolutely huge. Part of that, uh, part of the, the, that message is that the biggest tax havens in the world are not so much these little islands, but big, rich countries. The United Kingdom, my country, is one of the world's most important tax havens. And right now in Washington, D.C., I'm sitting in uh, one of the world's biggest tax havens as well, the United States. Uh, so this is something we need to really reappraise the whole geography of the system and understand how important it is. And when we're hearing figures of $100 plus billion dollars lost to the U.S. taxpayers, uh, I would argue that is just one aspect of the problem. The problem is much, much bigger. There are many, many other, other aspects to consider here. But when you say that the uh, United Kingdom itself is a tax haven, uh, what do you mean and how did that develop? Well, there are two aspects to this, really. One, one is the UK, the city of London, which is the financial district uh, of, of, the, of uh, the, the United Kingdom, uh, is itself a tax haven. And, and I need to explain a little bit what I mean by tax haven. There's no general agreement uh, uh, worldwide as to what a tax haven is. A lot of people focus on the tax element, but it's much more than that. Uh, tax havens do offer uh, zero or low taxes to people elsewhere, but they also offer secrecy. They offer escape routes from financial regulation. They offer escape routes from criminal laws. The key theme here is escape. If you don't want to do, if you are constrained by democratic rules and curbs at home, you take your money offshore, you take it elsewhere to, uh, to a place where they'll let you do what you're not allowed to do at home. And Looking at the history of this, Wall Street, uh, after the Second World War, uh, there were, uh, after the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, 1946, there was a cooperative international order set up where capital was tightly controlled around the world. Wall Street was very firmly put in its place, uh, and, and, you know, there were very high taxes on the wealthy. And for about a quarter of a century, this system more or less uh, uh, worked out, and capital was quite tightly constrained. It was also an area era of very high, broad-based economic growth, not just in the United States, but around the world. 
What happened during that period, though, uh, was that the banks, Wall Street in particular, didn't obviously didn't like these curbs, didn't like the Glass-Steagall Act that was separating uh, commercial from investment banking, didn't like interest rate caps, didn't like these controls. And essentially, they went off to London. And in London, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Bank of England and the City of London said, basically, you bring your money here and you can do what you like. You don't, we're not going to worry about Glass-Steagall. We're not going to worry about interest rate, rate caps. Uh, and, and, and so what happened is Wall Street piled into London from about the 60s onwards. And that really marked the unraveling of, uh, of, of uh, part of the unraveling of the Bretton Woods arrangements. Um, and Wall Street was able to grow incredibly fast offshore, uh, much, much faster than it had been before. And, and this ability to grow offshore, first in London uh, and then in a wider network of tax havens around the world, uh, this has been one of the great reasons why it has been able to grow so fast. And now we have too big to fail banks. And, and, and this offshore system, the ability of banks in the United States to go elsewhere, to do things that allow them to grow faster and take more risks uh, uh, away from the democratic curbs, it's, it's one of the reasons why they've, they've grown so powerful and why we have got such a, such a difficult situation today with Wall Street uh, having such power over the politicians in this country and my country and others. You, you talk in your book also about the, uh, about the, the uh, Britain cre recreating a new empire. And you mentioned all of the, the Caribbean islands that most Americans have heard about as vacation spots, but really don't uh, pay much attention to uh, Anguilla, uh, Bermuda, the, Ver the British Virgin Islands, Turks and Caicos. Uh, what uh, what are, role do they play uh, in uh, in this exploding uh, situation with tax havens? It's a very curious story. Um, I and my research, my co-researchers, went into the archives in the United United Kingdom and and looked at what they were saying at the time. What we had was a se we have a series of uh, partly British territories spread around the world, notably the overseas, the British overseas territories, which include the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, the Turks and Caicos, Gibraltar, Anguilla, uh, and the, the, the so-called Crown dependencies, which are closer to the UK. Uh, that's Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. And all of these centres uh, were allowed. They're, they're partly controlled by Britain. They do have independent politics as well. It's a sort of half in, half out uh, kind of offshore system. Uh, but Britain, so Britain has this kind of network around the world. But what this network does is that these places serve as conduits. They serve as uh, channels for business to, to be passed to the city of London. So there's this kind of network of havens around the world capturing business. So in the Caribbean, a lot of business captured from the United States, Latin America. And, and this is licit and illicit business. It's a mixture of, uh, of the two. And the Crown Dependencies, Jersey Guns in the Isle, Isle of Man, capturing business, focusing more on Europe perhaps in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and all this, they're, so they're serving as, as, as feeders for the city of London. And uh, I was talking about how the offshore system has been used to, uh, used by Wall Street to, to, to become so big and powerful. Well, the UK has, it, has its own special version of that, and that's this network which has really, uh, as well as the UK itself being a tax haven, this network feeding business into the city of London is, is an absolutely colossal reason why uh, the city of London is now, by some measure, the world's biggest financial centre. Um, so it, it, it's something that has has, uh, you know, it is at the period of decolonization, this is when this system really started getting together and, and, and started working. And, and one can make an argument that, that this is a, a new kind of financial empire uh, that Britain, uh, you know, a kind of hidden empire that nobody really has paid much attention to in, in it now. But it is of absolutely tremendous importance. And we in the United Kingdom are just as uh, we have the banks uh, holding our politicians by the throat. I think just as much as you do here in the United States. I wanted to go to U.S. presidential politics. One of the leading Republican presidential contenders, Mitt Romney, has a history of profiting from offshore tax havens. In 2008, the Los Angeles Times exposed how Romney, as head of Bain Capital, utilized shell companies and two offshore tax havens in Bermuda and the Cayman Islands to help eligible investors avoid paying U.S. taxes. The tax-friendly jurisdictions helped attract billions of investment dollars to Bain Capital. Uh, Los Angeles Times reporter Bob Drogan spoke to us about this in 2008. A sidelight of that was um, Bain Capital, which is today has uh, assets of about $60 billion. Uh, that's their the number that they officially say. Um, and about a third of that comes from these offshore uh, operations that uh, Romney set up when he was still there. 
um, in particular companies uh, that are set up really they're just mail drops they're they're mailboxes they don't have any staff they don't have any operations um, the one on Grand Cayman Island is a post office box 60D, I think, on Grand Cayman Island, and the one, the ones in Bermuda are, are uh, also at a uh, uh, at a lawyer's office, uh, but they've got them in other places as well, and they bring in somewhere uh, above 25 billion dollars a year. And again, it's these are companies, these are operations set up through. Uh, various systems. They're blocker corporations. They are uh, investment, uh, or rather, um, uh, uh, equity equity groups that are set up to attract, for the large part, foreign capital. And the reason these are set up overseas is so that foreign investors in 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 these private companies can avoid paying U.S. taxes. Mitt Romney and his colleagues don't get that advantage. So it's not like they're avoiding taxes through this. It's simply a way, what happens is they're helping other people avoid paying U.S. taxes, and as a result, they make enormous profits. That's Los Angeles Times reporter Bob Drogan speaking to us in 2008. Nicholas Shaxson, your response. Yeah, this is—I I mean, there are two, two things I'd respond to this. Um, first of all, there is uh, a lot of this business is legal. It is there is there are two terms: tax avoidance and tax evasion. Avoidance is by definition uh, not doing anything illegal, but also by definition getting around the spirit of the law. This is not what legisl legislators intended when they set up the legislation. Tax evasion, on the other hand, is is by definition criminal. It is it is uh, you're breaking the law, but. In between these two poles of evas evasion and avoidance is a huge gray area, and often you don't find out which side of uh, the law a company is until there's been, you know, a challenge by the IRS or a court case or something like that. Um, a British former British uh, Chancellor Dennis Healy once said the difference between avoidance and evasion is the thickness of a prison wall. Um, but also, th what the, the example of Mitt Romney. Romney I imagine what he was doing was was on the avoidance side, not on the evasion side. Uh, is this issue of intermediaries, people who help others, uh, and we're talking here particularly about accountancy firms, law firms, and banks, uh, and also company formation agents. Uh, these intermediaries have, for such a long time, seen a very simple calculus. They get—I uh, saw a statistic yesterday that, uh, for, for, for the big four accountancy firms, uh, on certain kinds of business, the average uh, profit for a, for a client was something like $360. The maximum fine for infringement of, uh, for assisting a client to, to, to do things that, are, that have gone wrong is $10,000. Uh, so it's a very simple calculation. You know, if you get caught well, you pay a bit of, bit of money, but it'll only be a fraction of your profits. And as a result of these kinds of incentives, you've had uh, the complete corruption of the culture of these these industries, saying we're just going to, uh, you know, help these people do. We don't care if they're breaking the law or avoiding tax or whatever. We'll just help them do 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 um, what they want to do. And it's a terrible. This corruption of the culture is one of the biggest problems of the whole the, the whole issue. Uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Jackson, I want to ask you about uh, uh, the por portion of your book that deals with the impact of these tax havens on the poor. Uh, countries of the world. You say at one point uh, in the book, nearly every effort to generate large flows of capital to developing countries since the 1980s has ended in crisis because the money has escaped offshore. Towering inequalities in Europe and the United States, not to mention in undeveloped countries, cannot be understood properly without exploring the role of secrecy jurisdictions. The systematic looting of the former Soviet Union and the merging of the nuclear armed countries' intelligence apparatus with organized crime is substantially a story that unfolds in London and its offshore satellites.